thank you for inviting me here. It's a real honor. Um, so I, I somewhat unwittingly found myself uh, a, a technologist. Uh, I am a researcher at UCLA doing research on crime uh, and uh, through research at UCLA uh, developed uh, some experiments that uh, ended up in the field in Los Angeles and uh, those uh, uh, panned out in a way that uh, we realized uh, in order to put these in the hands of police officers uh, in uh, wherever it might be needed, um, you needed to actually have software that worked in those settings. I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, uh, about the what predictive policing is all about. Um, this is a term that I did not come up with. It's something that was sort of foisted on uh, researchers and uh, police in some way, uh, and it's a term that's horribly un uh, misunderstood. I used to hate the term. Uh, uh, in part because I was compared to Tom Cruise. I'm not Tom Cruise in some ways. Um, but I've actually, <laughs> in some ways, yeah, I live in near Hollywood, so that's the only way in which I'm like Tom Cruise. Um, uh, let me just make sure this slide goes forward. Which one? Oh, the big green button. So um, predictive policing itself is a, is a misunderstood term. It can be used in many ways. And I'm going to talk about three things here in uh, about five minutes, 10 years worth of research in five minutes. Defining predictive policing is a critical thing. Um, knowing what we're talking about when we say predictive policing really matters. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the science behind the type of predictive policing that I actually engage in. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the necessity of actual testing. If you think about uh, pharmaceuticals, pharmaceuticals are required to go through some sort of testing procedure before they actually make the market. Now, is that a perfect testing procedure? Absolutely not. There are plenty of problems with clinical trials and the way that works. But what in the public sector actually receives that sort of scrutiny, right? That really matters. Okay, so defining crime prediction, I see it as a, a problem of really looking at what type of data are we talking about? Um, and uh, what are you trying to predict? So on what are you trying to predict, there are really two broad alternatives here. You can be thinking about, are you trying to predict who is going to commit a cr crime? Or are you going to be trying to predict where and when a crime is most likely to occur? On the data side, I really think of two broad categories of data. There are what we might call risk factors, and there are event histories. By risk factors, I mean explicitly those attributes of individuals and environments that are themselves not criminal in nature, right? So things like you know, demographic characteristics, socioeconomic characteristics, street networks, distributions of bars and, and churches, or whatever it happens to be, none of those things are criminal at, at all uh, in, in their very nature, yet those are things that people for centuries have said are correlated with crime in some way. So risk factors used to engage in predicting who uh, or where crime is most likely to occur versus event histories. And these are crimes that have been through some sort of verification process. Flawed as it may be, they are events that end up in databases that are recognized as this violates some sort of statute uh, in the jurisdiction in which it was recognized. If we put these things together, we end up with a nice sort of typology of the things that might be called predictive policing. So if you're using risk factors to predict a, who is going to commit a crime, this is what I would call criminal profiling, right? You're using things that are themselves not criminal in their, in their nature to predict who is going to commit a crime. If you're using risk factors to predict where crime is most likely to occur, this gets called risk terrain modeling, right? Using the distribution of demographic groups or socioeconomic characteristics to predict where crime is going to occur is risk terrain modeling. Event histories to predict uh, who is uh, um, going to commit a crime is sort of the domain of um, what I'd call intelligence-led policing or in the... Um, in the judicial system, I guess this is the risk assessment uh, type approach. And then finally, uh, in the domain in which I work, you might call this sort of event-based place-based uh, place -based prediction. This is using event histories to predict where and when crime is most likely to occur. What I'd like to consider as sort of a conversation point uh, here today is, what are the consequences of false positives in each of these spaces, right? The false positives and the models themselves really interact in a very important way, such that a false positive driven by risk factors used to predict who is going to commit a crime is quite different from a false positive where you're using event histories to predict where and when crime is most likely to occur. Um, and I'm happy to hear uh, your ideas on, on, the, on that issue in particular. Um, 
So in the space in which I work, we work explicitly on using event histories to predict where and when crime is most likely to occur. And I want you to consider the problem from the point of view of police officers, right? Police officers have an obligation to deal with crime on a day-to-day -day basis, right? The patrol officer who is out there on the streets today has to deal with crime on a day-to-day -day basis. And we often think sort of conceptually about crime as what you see on the left-hand side here, big hotspots of bad neighborhood over here, good neighborhood over there, and that's how police resources are allocated. But in reality, police have to confront what you see over on the right-hand side here, which is day-to-day -day, uh, violent crime in Chicago. Hotspots are not stationary. They're constantly moving around. Where a crime occurs yesterday is not the same as where it occurs today, and police are uh, obligated to sort of allocate the resources that they do have in response to the crimes that are occurring. And predictive policing in the space in which I work is about saying, can we understand how those hotspots are evolving? Not go to where the, the uh, burglary was yesterday or where the shooting was yesterday, but go to where it's going to be today and provide some preventative uh, response to the crime that, uh, that may occur today. So provide some preventative response. I'll say that um, importantly, and this will be my final point here, importantly, the, um, the data that we're working with is event-based in the following way. It is only about what type of crime is it, where did it occur, and when did it occur. That data is interesting in a couple of different ways. Most crimes, if they're known to the police, have those three bits of information. Often you don't know who the offenders might be, what their motivations were, you know, any of those sorts of things, but you do know what, where, and when. I'll also ask you to consider that for a lot of crimes, not all of them, it varies from crime to crime, a lot of those events come to the attention of the police from the public, right? A burglary, police do not know about that unless the public reports it to them, right? A car theft, the same sort of thing. If, the if it's not reported to the police, they don't know that. And as a result, I might argue that um, if the police are using those data for predictive policing, they're actually being responsive to public demand, right? Those are the crimes that the public wants the police to know about, and using that is actually being responsive to what the public wants to know. So happy to continue the conversation. Thank you.